first you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Homestay Language Learning, Lisa McDowell here. How can I help you? Hello, my name's Dan. Hello, Dan. And I'm going to be living with a family in Edinburgh for three months, so I'd like some advice on what to bring with me. I'm flying in via Singapore on the 15th. Right. Well, perhaps most important of all are your documents. Vaccination certificate, sponsor's letter, and the certifying letter from us for immigration. Yes, I've got all those in order, I think. What I'm really wondering about are money and clothes and things for my room. Personal effects, in other words. OK. Let's start with cash. You'll already have money in your bank account here, of course, but make sure when you get here you have some cash on you. Pounds, that is, not euros or dollars. How much do you suggest? I'd say 50 as an absolute minimum. OK. Now, the next thing is which clothes to bring. What do you think? Well, as I'm sure you know, it can get pretty cold here, so you will need some warm clothing. There are shops near here that sell winter clothes quite cheaply, so you really don't need to bring much. Do make sure, though, that you have at least one thick sweater and a jacket with you when you arrive here. The temperature's likely to be a lot lower than in Singapore. <laughs> Thanks for the warning. Now... Something else I'm not sure about is whether to bring my computer. It's a laptop, so it won't take up much room. Two problems. Firstly, it might not be compatible with the electricity supply in this country. And secondly, there's a risk of it getting broken in transit. Someone travelling here had hers smashed only last month. But surely I can carry it as hand luggage? Usually, yes, but because of all the tight security right now, you may have to check it in. So my advice is to leave yours at home. OK, I think I will. Is there anything else you'd advise against bringing? Well, you won't need household or cooking things. They'll all be provided. And importing food, of course, isn't allowed by customs, though I imagine you already knew that. Well, yes. But there are one or two things I'd suggest you find room for in your suitcase. Yes? Perhaps a few of your favourite cassettes or compact discs. Of course, you might be able to find them in the shops here, but then again you might not. That's a good idea. Anything else? Yes. Some photographs of people and places that are special to you could be nice. They can really make your room feel like home. <laughs> it's just a thought. I'll see if I've got a few good ones. <laughs> Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Just a few points about packing. Make sure all your cases are clearly labelled, in English, with your host family's name and address, just in case they go missing on the way. It has been known to happen. What name do I write, by the way? It's Wark, Lewis and Amy Wark. So that's W-A-L-K? <laughs> It's actually W-A-R-K. Oh. 
But we'll be posting full details to you later this week. Right, fine. And I'd better put some essentials in my hand luggage. Enough for a night or two in case, as you say, anything happens to my main cases. <laughs> yes, I'd recommend a change of T-shirt and socks and so on, plus any medication you may need, and a toothbrush, of course. And my tights. <laughs> Your tights? Yes, for the flight. Wearing them helps prevent deep vein thrombosis when you're <sighs> flying long distances, not getting any exercise. Oh, yes, I've heard about that. Now, talking about exercise, there's one last thing. When you've packed your baggage, check you can carry it, all of it, at least 500 metres without any help. You may have to do that. OK. Well, thanks for all your help. You've cleared up a lot of points. Oh, you're welcome. Have a safe journey, and we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You're going to listen to a talk about the food we eat. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to The Food We Eat, sponsored by Safeway. Increasingly, we know more about the effects of our eating habits and lifestyles on our health. While new information can change old ideas, the new stories can often be confusing. At Safeway, we try to help customers not only in the range and types of food offered, but also by providing up-to-date, reliable information in areas we know are of interest and which relate to the diet we eat. Today, we are going to talk about sugar. Recently, doctors have been advising us to eat less sugar. The health recommendation to use less sugar is for two reasons. Firstly, for the sake of our teeth, since the amount and frequency of sugar consumption links to decay. Secondly, as sugar is a good source of calories, it can easily be a problem if we tend to be overweight. The dental risk is because bacteria which occur naturally in our mouth feed on carbohydrates, sugar and starch, to form plaque and acid. Plaque is a sticky coating that prevents the bacteria being removed by saliva. The acid attacks the tooth itself. This takes time, however, so the trick is to avoid sticky foods like sweets, which stay around in crevices feeding the bacteria. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20.
Regular brushing, preferably with a fluoride toothpaste, helps remove particles and resist acid. The worst thing you can do is nibble sweet things between meals. It puts your teeth under constant attack. A sweet tooth develops gradually. And you might be surprised at how you can steadily unlearn the taste, taking in fewer calories and saving your teeth. Here are some ways. A. Gradually cut down the sugar in tea and coffee till you can stop altogether or switch to sweetness. B. Choose snacks with a lower sugar content. Fresh fruit, raw vegetables, crackers, milk or low-flat natural yogurt. Remember, some fruits like raisins have lots of sugar. C. Look for reduced sugar alternatives. There are more and more around, from diet drinks to yogurts, even jams and sauces. D. Try gradually to cut back on the sugar you use in cooking, especially in baking. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between two work colleagues and their manager about the restructuring of their company. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Come in, both of you. I believe you wanted to talk to me about something, is that right? Yes. Basically, all the staff are concerned about what the restructuring of the company is going to mean for them. None more so than myself and Nam, as we are the newest members. Oh, as I said to all staff at the meeting last week, there's no cause for concern. There will be no compulsory redundancies. All redundancies will be on a voluntary basis. Yes, we, we understand that, but to tell the truth, we just want a little reassurance that our jobs are safe. Look, Anne, and Penny, the company isn't going to be short-sighted and let its bright young minds go. Besides, we've already met our target for the number of voluntary redundancies we want to secure. In fact, there's a waiting list. You know as well as I do that the age profile of staff at this company needs to come down. A lot of our employees are close to retirement age and are just going through the motions until they can take their pensions. That's why we decided on this redundancy initiative. We want to encourage those that would be happy to leave to do so and employ younger, more motivated staff. I guess that makes us feel a little better. But we're also worried about the upcoming salary review. What would it mean for us? Given the fact that the company's motivation for this restructuring initiative is not to cut costs, one again, you needn't be worried that there will be a negative effect on your salaries. We are running a very profitable business and we will reward our top performers in the upcoming review. Both of you fall into that category so you can expect a healthy bonus and salary increase. Simple as that. That's good to know. Another thing on our minds was the fact that with all these voluntary redundancies happening in the next few months, there will be a lot of positions opening up higher in the company. 
What we were wondering is, will the recruitment drive be an internal or an external one? Obviously, we will recruit internally where possible. That has always been company policy. So, if you're asking me will there be opportunities to gain a promotion in the near future, then the answer is very definitely yes. The type of candidate we would be looking for has a proven track record and is performance driven. How can we improve our chances of getting promoted then when the opportunity arises? Well, in the meantime, be prepared to take on additional responsibilities, especially those relating to the management of other members of staff. Obviously, the higher up you go in the company, the more involved you'll be in managing people. What the management team is looking for then is proof that you can work effectively with and manage other members of staff. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. One more thing. Go on. This project you've given us to manage, is it a test of our abilities? I guess you could say it is a test of sorts, but look at it more as a chance for you to prove yourselves. Actually, now that I have you both here in private, can we talk about that a bit? Of course. OK. Penny. Let's start with you. Has the timescale been agreed yet? Yes. You said we have a total of eight weeks to bring the product to launch. So we've decided to allocate three weeks at the beginning to product research and prototype testing. Very good. Then after that, we are going to spend a further three weeks formulating our marketing strategy and doing some research and testing on a sample of the target market itself to get some feedback. And presumably the last two weeks will be devoted to the launch? Exactly. Now, let's talk estimated costs. Well, you've given us a total budget of £100,000. Of that, we're allocating 50% to product development and testing a further 25% to marketing, and £25,000 will be spent on the launch. Penny, give me a breakdown of the launch costs, would you? Sure. £10,000 will be spent on hiring and decorating the venue, £10,000 will be spent on promotional work, and the remaining money will be used to pay for catering and administrative costs. Uh, I'm very happy with that, to be honest. As I said... You guys should stop worrying. You're doing a fantastic job, so keep it up. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Fine. Listen to the second part of our lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. River dance is not just an expression of self confidence, a kind of culturally interesting pop song. It tells the story of a people through song and dance. It tells the story of the people whose spirit was broken by an event which occurred in the middle of the last century but continued to affect the society until 1961, the Great Famine. What is a famine? In 1840, the official population of Ireland was 8 million. They were largely poor and living in the countryside. They were beginning to have an interest in independence and perhaps had things been different, Ireland might have been independent much earlier. But there was a serious problem in the agricultural system. All crops were grown to pay the rent of the land, and all that was grown to eat was the potato. This was fine until the potato crop failed, as it did from 1845 to 1848. The stories of what happened in those times live on in the popular culture of Ireland, and I won't tell them here, but the result was that two million people died or left the country by 1851. When you realise that the population continued to go down until 1961, you can realise what a disastrous effect this famine had on the people. Compared with China, imagine if the famine of 1960 reduced the population by a quarter and it kept falling to less than half of its pre-famine figure. Anybody with ideas left and went to England, America or Australia. The people left behind were broken by their experiences and, in effect, the famine and its consequences put an end to all serious development in the country until well into this century. The Irish in Ireland lost all hope and self-confidence and much of our modern culture is about the sadness of that time and the sorrow of saying goodbye to those who left and left well into this century. Ireland has the highest emigration rate of any country in Europe for the last two centuries. We even have an expression for this saying goodbye. It is called the American Wake. It means the ceremony, like that of a funeral for someone going to America, because you will never see him or her again. Do you know why there is Irish music on the film Titanic? It is because most of the people killed were Irish. The leaving continued until the 1970s, because independence in 1921 was followed by a civil war and an economic depression. Almost every family in Ireland has relatives abroad, and up to the 60s in some places, of a class of 30 graduating from high school all left. Along the west coast, closed up houses from that time falling into ruin are still common. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.